My name is Suresh Bhargav. I'm a deputy provost of International Saramite University and the host of this session. The good thing is that we all are energized. So even in the evening part, every enthusiasm is here. You saw the, the one part of the India. Now you are going to see the second part of the India, and you can see the title clearly that my vision of India. There is a one, probably the unexpected news, that everybody was hoping that probably the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh or the Yawa, Yawa Turk leaders, the Apshek Yadav, will be here. But instead of him, we have the, the real young leader from India, Uttar Pradesh, I will say, um, the uh, doctor or professor Apshek Mishra. Uh, I'm not going to introduce him because uh, he'll be introduced by the chair. Uh, Neville Roche, but I am going to introduce the Neville Roche, who is the Order of Australia, and is the chairman of the advisory board of the Tata Consultancy Service over here. So Neville Roche has enjoyed a distinguished career in the information technology. He has been here in 1961 in Australia. In fact, he told me that at that time Australia was a some sort of a white Australia. So he has seen all those changes there uh, over here. And uh, he has a distinguished career, as you can see, he's a, he's a Order of Australia, and he's very much involved with the Indo-Australian relations as well. And uh, I, in fact, invite uh, Neville Roche as a chair of this session to introduce the, um, Professor Abhishek Mishra. But before I do that, I will take this privilege to say at least few words in a Hindi language, ki Professor Abhishek Mishra ji, aapka Melbourne ke andar swagat hai. Melbourne ki ye sub audience jis mein aap mix dekh rahe hain, ki isme Hindi bhi hai, Australian bhi hai, aapka swagat karti hain. Aur ye swagat aisa nahi hai, tahe dil se swagat hai. Thank you very much, Suresh, for that very kind introduction. Um, I would like to acknowledge the original owners of this land, the Aboriginal people of this region. Uh, I pay respect to their uh, lasting and living culture, uh, which has survived the assault of all of us migrants and children of migrants. And I pay respects to their elders past and present. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Professor Abhishek, Abhishek Mishra, who is the Honorable Minister, Department of Protocol, Government of Uttar Pradesh. Uttar Pradesh, as you would all know, is India's largest state. Today, today Dr. Mishra will be talking about, will be, we will be listening to the voice of new India, India present and India future, because he will be speaking on behalf of uh, Mr. Akhilesh Yadav, the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, who was expected to be with us today. Unfortunately, other commitments have presented him, prevented him from coming to Australia. But uh, we are very fortunate that he is being, uh, we, will, we will hear his voice channeled through uh, Professor Mishra. Akhilesh Yadav is India's youngest ever chief minister, but we, we will not be missing out on youth because uh, our speaker, he tells me, is four and a half years younger than him. All of us know that uh, the, the primary reason for India's spectacular growth recently and the hope for India in the future is its young population. The, the burgeoning people of working age is what gives India the edge, uh, but of course uh, getting productive use of that working age will depend very much on leaders uh, like our speaker today. So could you join me please in welcoming Professor Misha to speak to The chairman of the ceremony, of the session, the master of the ceremony, His Excellency, Mr. Birin Nanda, the High Commissioner of India to, the, to, uh, to Australia, Mr. Robert Johansson, Chairman of the Australia India Institute, Professor Amitabh Mattu, Director of the Australia India Institute, distinguished guests, invited speakers, and my dear friends, Aap sabhi ko Professor Abhishek Mishra ka sadar pranam, sadar naman. <laughs> My obeisance to all of you and 
I'm going to uh, speak out and read a speech on behalf of the Honorable Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, Mr. Akhilesh Yadav. The words are his, the feelings are his. I'm only communicating on his behalf. However, I will be, you will see tones of what we are trying to do, and I'll be very happy to take the questions at the end. Obviously, that, the responses will be entirely mine. <laughs> it's a privilege and an honor to address this August gathering and a, indeed a humbling experience. And I, that I have been asked to deliver the special address by the Australian Indian Institute on special insistence of Professor Matu on my vision of India. And when I say my vision, it means Prof, uh, Akhleshi's vision of India. The feeling is all the more special because this gives me an opportunity to speak to an audience in Australia. Uh, French, I'm going to use the first person, so I'm going to live with I when I, when I give the speech. So please uh, relate with that here. I wish I could have been here in person to share my vision, but certain unforeseen circumstances prevent me from doing so. The loss is, of course, mine. At the outset, I must thank the Institute, which is a leading center of intellectual dialogue and research partnership between India and Australia. I have come across some of their work that the Australia Indian Institute has done, and I've also read their task force report on public perception. I must say that the policy recommendations made in that report are outstanding, and I hope that leaders from both India and Australia have taken serious note of those recommendations. Before getting into the topic, I must share with you how delighted I am to be a part of one of the most exciting conferences to be held in Melbourne. On account of spending quite a few of my favorite years and formative years, Australia has and will always hold a special place in my heart. Uh, Akhilesh Yadavji was educated here, so he did a master's in environmental sciences at Sydney. And he lived as a paying guest with an Australian family. And he goes on to say that the country has not only given me great education, but also great friendships and for the life and memories to cherish forever. It is no secret that Australia is home to some of the world-class institutions of learning and higher education. Students from all over the world, including India, arrived here in large numbers for their higher education, and it is a proof to the quality and commitment of uh, the professionals in Australia. It is precisely for the same reason that I landed in this country, and I must confess that my stay here was a wonderful experience. However, what we often fail to recognize is that there exists so much similarity in values between Australia and India. At the political level, both countries are vibrant democracies. Both India and Australia understand the importance of devolution of power, and hence, the federal system of governance where the individual states and the center are supposed to work in harmony. At the societal level, while India boasts of its ability to manage its huge diversity and maintain social harmony through pluralism, Australian society is an epitome of what an ideal multicultural society can look like. Now coming back to the idea of my vision of India. I am fortunate to be the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh. Just to give you some sense of enormity of the job, the state has a population of well over 200 million, and if it was a separate country, it would be the fifth largest country in the world today. The state of Uttar Pradesh is described as one of the most politically complex states in India, and often the most significant one as well. Even though I have been the Chief Minister of the state only for a few months now, my engagement with electoral politics is more than a decade old. If the famous British Prime Minister Harold Wilson is to be believed, a week is supposedly a very long time in politics. And therefore, a decade might seem like eternity. However, personally, I think there are many miles to be covered and many promises to be kept. Politics in my state often is a microcosm of what politics in India is generally about. And therefore, it places me in a comfortable position to transpose the vision of my state to that of India. For the sake of this address, and in the interest of time allocated to me, let me be brief and focus on three important issues. 
The three issues that I'm going to talk about in detail today is the importance of youth, the importance of innovation, and the importance of experience at the same time. Let me start by youth. These are interesting times in India, and one of the aspects that everyone takes note of is the huge number of youth population in India. Currently, about 50% of our population is below the age of 25, and more than 65% below the age of 35. By 2020, it is expected that the average age of the Indian will be 29 years. Now, we all know that these num huge number of youngsters need to be educated. They need to be trained and skilled so that they can fuel our economy and raise the standards of life. For a country like India, this is a huge challenge and deserves highest priority. <coughs> However, in my vision of India, I would like to see a substantial number of these youngsters also come into politics. In my limited understanding of politics, one lesson that I have come to learn and appreciate the most is the ability of politics to enable social transformation. If it is for this reason, I urge more and more youth to, con to come forward and contribute with their constructive ideas and make Indian democracy more vibrant and egalitarian at the same time. When I used to go for election campaigning, one of the things I used to tell the youth was that you're free to go and become an engineer, a doctor, an IAS, a civil servant, or you know, an, a scientist, an astronaut. Please go ahead, put in all your effort and my best wishes that you achieve your goal. But if you change your mind, and on the way you, you think about the country, and about wanting to contribute back to the society and to the egalitarianism, to the inclusivity of the democracy that we live in, come and join me. And we'll both together make our country and its politics better. Turn the pages of history and you'll find that most of the people who made the deepest impact in politics are the ones who renounced their vocations, what they were doing. The world would not have been the same if Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, had remained satisfied practicing law in, Af in uh, South Africa. That is not to say that people should not take up their jobs or not do anything else than politics. But just to underline the fact that new, fresh ideas are what sustains politics, and it is most likely that they will come from the youth. I now move to the second point, the innovation. In my vision of India, I see a country which is doing cutting-edge research, is home to the most exciting innovations taking place around the world, and also make sure that these innovations have the quality of inclusivity in it. What I mean is that innovations of tomorrow's India should be put to use to benefit maximum number of people of my country and should be customized accordingly. We can't afford to lag behind in the 21st century and should put in all our efforts to encourage innovations that benefit a whole range of people, starting and focusing, if I may say so, to on the farmers and those associated with agriculture to those who are in the domain of high technology research. After I became the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, I planned for around 1.8 million laptops and 2.4 million tablets to be distributed to school kids. It is one of the largest initiatives ever taken by a government anywhere in the world. The main agenda and the focus is to bridge the digital divide, is to put a computer in the hands of everybody, every child, and let a thousand flowers bloom. You never know, you might get a Steve Ballmer there, a Microsoft there, a Google there, or you know, another company which is yet to be named to be born from there. That is the vision, that is the mission, that is the ambition. I believe technology should be a tool to empower every individual. Because India is such a diverse country with so many languages and cultures, often technology needs to be ta to take a leap from its standardized version to one that is suitable in the local context, that is globalized. In my vision, that is what true empowerment of the Indian citizen would mean. One can get the knowledge one aspires to and still be rooted in his or her language and script. Only then the self-worth of an individual will be truly realized. 
The IT sector should not just be restrict restricted to a few satellite towns and suburbs, but its benefits should swamp the national landscape, reaching every nook and corner of the country. With this aim, we have pushed the agenda of ITization of Uttar Pradesh, and we are going to create new IT clusters in Lucknow, in Kanpur, in Allahabad, in Agra, apart from the other destinations where IT is already a dominant force. Tomorrow's India should not think only on individual terms, but nationally. For this, innovations in science and technology should be put to optimal use for national goals, be it in terms of space exploration or for infrastructure development. Here we should collaborate and learn from countries like Australia on how to use technology effectively and cut down both costs and times on, for example, infrastructure building projects that are extremely necessary for the Indian economy to be on the fast lane. I come to my third agenda for the day, experience. We've heard a lot of people talking about importance of youth and India becoming a younger country, but can we ignore history? Can we ignore experience? Or, you know, we just need to throw the oldies out and get the young blood in. Is that the solution? The way I position this uh, debate and the position that I want to take today is no, we need both. You need the energy of the youth, but the guidance of the experience. You need them both together. And if we can do that together, we've achieved a successful model. Experience, my focus on youth and politics should not be seen as a substitute for experience. It is often said that democracies are measured by where they're going rather than where they're coming from. While this may be true, for a civilizational state like India, with its contradictions and diversities and puzzles, history will always impact, if not determine, its future. Our vision of India should always factor in that aspect of history and make sure that we learn the right lessons and do not commit the same mistakes for short-term gains. History teaches us the importance of a long-term vision. Experience gives that guidance to youth. While the youth needs to lead from the front, the experience of the past should always guide them against the pitfalls ahead. As India is on the rise, aspirations of its citizens are much higher today than they were ever before. Today, they want to break free of the shackles of the past and make sure that we achieve what we think, what they could not think of dreaming even a couple of decades earlier. These aspirations need careful management. And in the coming years, I would like to see those aspirations fulfilled, not by empty promises and hollow hopes, but by bringing in substantial changes in the life of an ordinary citizen. An Indian citizen today is simultaneously local as well as global. They are rooted in the ethos and traditions that define India, but are equally at ease to travel distant continents and make a mark for themselves through sheer diligence intellectual honesty and hard work. In my vision of India, the traditional and the modern should be weaved in a seamless whole as an individually, they both coexist and together they produce something spectacular. As I said earlier, about an aspirational India, today, those aspirations know no borders, no boundaries. Therefore, it is critical that we manage our external relations in a sophisticated manner. One of the ways is to reach out to our friends with whom there is convergence of thought, values, and interests. It would not be an exaggeration to say that this is precisely the reason and the time when the Indian-Australian relationship should take off on an upward trajectory. Both the countries have so much to give to each other, to learn from each other, and both of us deserve to be understood on our own terms. The maturity with which we handle this precious relationship will be a marker of the extent to which these two great democracies evolve as nations. I once again congratulate the Australia Indian Institute for the service it is doing in bringing the two nations together and bring the epicenter of intellectual and cultural exchange between India and Australia. I urge the leaders of my country when I go back home as well as those of Australia that are present here to continue their wholehearted support for the Institute and wish the Australia Institute, Institute all success in future under the able leadership of Professor Amitabh Mattu. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mishra. I don't know about all of you, but uh, from my point of view, hearing two great leaders, young leaders, uh, uh, Mr. Yadav, as well as Mr. Mishra, Dr. Mishra, uh, filled me with a great sense of optimism for the future of India. You know, if, you, are you happy to yeah, take, happy questions? take questions? So could I ask you, tell us your name and affiliation, and then 15 minutes. Yeah, that's fine. Can you hear me loud now? I, I can't. Uh, I can't use this. I can't get it to work. Just give me a second, shot though. Hello. Yeah, yeah. yeah working. Yeah. Okay. Please. So my question is that, like, spoke about the vision of India, but isn't somewhere uh, leading India from a from the perspective of youth divided? Like, like if I if I'm allowed to kind of, I'm not a political analyst, but like your party, their um, their mandate for the UP elections was it kind of literally outbid every other party when it came to providing facilities for, for Muslims and the Muslim youth especially. So isn't that kind of identity politics still very prominent in India? And that is one of, I think that's one of the major hindrances. And after that also kind of scrapping 26 projects which uh, Mayawati, uh, before you guys had started off for Dalits. So isn't that kind of uh, clearly showing signals that identity politics and rotating around you know, vote banks still very prominent in India. And in such a scenario, it's, it's pretty tough to imagine when you have divided people, you know, all of them leading forward. Yeah. yeah thank you so much. Okay. So as far as provisions for a special group of people is concerned, yes, there are special provisions for different groups, and they, they are approved and provided for by the Constitution of India. So you, if there is a certain group which is disadvantaged, you can have special provisions for their upliftment. But what we are trying to do is we are trying to tie up that whatever we are giving with an agenda of education. So what, whatever we are doing, we are helping, uh, for example, the special scheme that you talked about Muslims. That is targeted and they will get it only and if they go on to study beyond class 12 which is in itself a way for promoting Muslim girls to go on for further education rather than getting married off or not, or parents withdrawing them from uh, the education sector or the educational stream. So it is achieving a very noble cost to that extent. And just to add to that, it is not limited to Muslims. It is for Muslims, that's right, but it is not limited to them. It is for all castes, all religions below the poverty line. So even a Brahmin girl uh, from below the poverty line is entitled to 30,000 rupees if the family earns less than 36,000 per month. So that's uh, that, uh, the second thing, the point you said about uh, 26 projects getting scrapped. I don't know which projects you're mentioning to because I'll just give you uh, the whole group an example. There was a hugely ambitious project by the BSP government, which was the Yamuna Expressway. And there's all sorts of talks and rumors that, you know, the leaders of that party had invested money in that. So with our government in power, we had the option of not starting that project. But when we came to power, the Honorable Chief Minister said, you know, this is beyond politics. The economic development of the state cannot be, uh, you know, tested on the grounds of politics. So if a road has been built, there's no point keeping it on hold for the next, you know, five years or 10 years or 20 years. And when the next government comes for BSP, if, if they do at all, only then we don't, no, we'll not do that. Let's rise above politics in the interest of economic interest of the people, of the state, of the country, and open this road. And we inaugurated that road, and I'm sure you've heard about that. So we are, we are trying to detach politics and economics. There's a young lady there. Thanks. Uh, is it okay if I stand with you? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Natasha. Um, I just had a comment and a question as well. Firstly, I don't think it's right to compare India to Australia or any developed country for that matter, because the issues that India has are very yeah. different. So saying that technology is working well here is not a reason why we need technology in India. Uh, the second... The question that I have is, um, it's very important for people to get their basic needs met, food, clothing, shelter, sanitation. So to go about and distribute laptops and tablets when people might not even have electricity to charge those laptops and tablets is not the best way to do that. So uh, what is your opinion on that? And sorry, it was a joint question, so. Uh, Hi, uh, my name is Zubin. <laughs> so, sorry. No, no, there was one more thing I wanted to point out. Uh, 
as far as I'm not a law student, but I read Preamble of India, and what the Preamble of Indian Constitution states very clearly that the role of a government and parliament is to provide social equality. I mean, social equality and uh, other kind of stuff. I mean, th does that's the, that's equality? the mandate, right? Does it say social equality? Yeah, it does. I mean, uh, if you read the uh, Preamble of India, I'm surprised you haven't read that. I mean, that's kind yeah. of surprising. But no, that's okay. Go on. Go yeah, on. but forget I mean, the so preamble. That is the mandate of uh, our constitution. I mean. Who has asked you to actually, I mean, go ahead and build roads? I mean, first you need to uh, provide basic necessities like, such as food, shelter, electricity. Yeah. So how do you Agreed. address that? So, so I think that question is more for BSP, which built the road. We just opened the road. <laughs> so, so <laughs> and, and, and that's assuming that we have an individual in the group who says we should not build roads. But anyway, so to come to the question that uh, the lady raised here, uh, the first point you said, why give away laptops? Yeah, when we need uh, electricity or when we need uh, sanitation and medicine. The idea is not to cut budgets from sanitation and electricity and this, but to still find money from somewhere which will fund laptops. And the Honorable Chief Minister in his budget speech when he declared the provision for laptops said that the, all the money that was spent on building parks and statues, which was about eight to 10,000 crore rupees, We'll take 4,000 crore rupees from there and not spend it on those parks and give, give away laptops. So that, I think that answers that question. In, uh, wherever, uh, you know, in terms of sanitation and electricity, that's a huge challenge. And uh, we're not doing anything at that cost. You know, it's like you don't uh, do an educational degree at University of Melbourne and not buy clothes or not eat food. You do all the three things together. So the challenge for the government is to find money and resources, optimize allocation in a manner where we can do all of that together. We're not choosing one over the other. Yeah? Does that answer your question? No, but still, if you have a question, you can still ask that. No problem. No, no I, I think, I think uh, it's the first time ever that I've heard of a joint question. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and all I would suggest is, is that if you're, not, if you're not already married, then you should consider that. <laughs> Dr. Rajkumar. See, see this, is the this is the importance of youth over experience. <laughs> <laughs> experience has that edge. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. It Raj, was yeah. really a, a good presentation. I just wanted to make one comment. I think it's important. Can I have questions and not comments. OK, good. Sorry to interrupt. All yeah. right, give, I'll give, give you the question. Yeah. The question is this. You talked about the sort of infrastructure and IT and other forms of development that is taking place. We know that one of the biggest challenges of India, and specifically Uttar Pradesh, is uh, the inability to establish a rule of law society. The, one of the greatest challenges we in India are facing is that rule of law has not been entrenched, and that affects a number of aspects Absolutely. of governance. So on the basis of a question that was given to the Legislative Assembly in UP, an answer was given between 1st of March and 15th of April, there were 699 murders committed in the state of Uttar Pradesh. This mm -hmm. is government statistics. And then after six months, another query was raised, and there were another 1,000-plus murders were committed, all in the state of UP. It was a question. Answer was given in the Legislative Assembly itself. Okay. So my question is... We've only had one session so far anyway. Sorry? So we've only had one session of the Assembly no, so it was, far. No, it was, it was... So both, both cannot be in the Assembly session. No, the point was the question was given by one of the Legislative Assembly members, okay. and it was reported back to it. Now, this, that's a, we can all, always find that out. No, that's fine. My question really is, what are the steps that the government is taking to establish a rule of law society? Perfect, okay. So uh, the first comment is he has statistics, which I'm sure the government even today doesn't have. Because, you know, he's talking about eight months of statistics. I'm, you know, Anurag Ji is sitting here, he's district magistrate of Lucknow. I'm sure no, there's no agency, there's no way of putting out crime statistics. Rashid Alvi Sahib is here. He's been in doing this for ages now, answering questions, right? And uh, there's no way that, you, that question uh, and that data is correct. But even if it is, let, let's assume that it, it is, uh, we're talking about crime. And crime as a problem is everywhere. You know, if, I'd be very, very surprised that if we calculated murders per capita, the crime in, rate in Uttar Pradesh would be higher than the crime rate in New York. It would not be. And I can place my bets. I'm happy to place my bets on that. So the question, so crime is different from rule of law. That, 
Uh, Raj, we can discuss this uh, uh, otherwise as well, and I can give you hard data as well. But that's my uh, presumption. It could be wrong. I'd be very happy if I get that wrong. But I think per capita rate of murders in UP would be lesser than in, in the United States. The per capita prison population in UP, in UP in India is far lesser than the United States. So, but the point is, if, if, when we're talking about rule of law, we definitely need a rule of law. There's no doubt on that. But guys, I was only talking about my vision of India. It was not an exhaustive list. It's not everything that we're doing. It's just three points that I touched upon. What we're doing for rule of law, we're trying to place right officers at the right place. We are trying to see, yeah, we've got Anurag as DM Lucknow, so yes. Professor Mattu, uh, you know, says that's a good thing to do. And uh, other than that, we are, we are trying to, <laughs> we are also trying to be non-partisan when it comes to party workers. You've seen that there was a reporting, and I, I, I call it a trial by media. There's still no inquiry, no judgment, no findings. There was a reporting in the media that a uh, level, that a senior legislator tried to abduct a, a medical professional, he was asked to leave the ministry and go within 24 hours. That's what we are trying to do. You, nobody ever indicts a minister and throws him out of the ministry within 24 hours on a reported crime. There was no inquiry even today. The inquiry is under the process. So if that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to give a very clear signal that no nonsense will be tolerated. Sorry, that, that, he's been very patient yeah. he's waiting. So, here, yes. Yeah, yeah gentlemen here. You have to introduce yourself. Yeah. Sorry, once again, please. Shane Sharon from University of South Australia. Uh -huh. What's the gap between the energy demand and energy production in UP? If you travel to Western UP, you know it's, it's, it's in a terrible situation. Oh, yes, absolutely. So I want to know <laughs> figures. I, I'll give the, you the figures. How much you are yeah, investing. I'll give you the figures. Yeah. Otherwise, all these ambitions never get fulfilled if you don't invest into basic I agree I agree so the figures are like this the peak demand at the moment is about 18,000 megawatts per day the production is about 13,000 megawatts per day so there has been a shortfall for of about five to six thousand at a time like Diwali it could be even 20 21,000 per day because everybody lights up his home uh, there's not been a single not one unit of electricity added megawatt of electricity added to the production capability in the last five years under the BSP regime. And the last, uh, before that, we had two years of government wherein we had added 1,100 megawatts. Or oh, I'm not saying that we don't need to set it right. All that I'm saying is we are working towards that. And my friends, ladies and gentlemen, I'd still like to say that ambitions and visions are still relevant. Because only when we try for those ambitions, when we have those visions, when we have those dreams, that you'll aspire and it, it hurts you at night that, look, we want to do this and we're not able to do this, that you'll not be able to sleep, get up in the morning, go out and do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, another young lady there. I hope it's not a joint question. <laughs> no, she, she, she's sitting next to somebody else. Because, because, be, because you're not allowed to marry the person next to yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, we're spiritually married, you know, she's my bonda, so it's okay. Yeah, oh, um, Professor Mishra, um, because we're talking about the vision of India, I'm very curious to know regarding your vision in terms of... Um, yeah, could you be slightly louder? Yeah. Yep, better? Yeah. Hold the mic closer to you. Okay, um, it's regarding the, the vision that you have for the women, you know, the empowerment of women in the future of India. I mean, what's your take on that and what sort of strategies or... Awareness programs have you thought of? Yeah. Yep. I think what, and that, that has been to a great extent the reason why we have not grown at the rate at which we would like to grow or at the rate with which we have the potential to grow. Because we have not utilized 50% of the human asset properly that the country had, which is women. I think India must open all out and anything that becomes a hindrance that comes on the process, whether anything you know, that is related to a gender issue has to be sorted out because that's a hugely captive uh, national asset, national resource that we have underutilized. I must, we must optimize on that. Schemes, there could be tens of, uh, of thousands of them, you know, because issues regarding women are different. Somebody going to uh, Jesus and Mary in Delhi has very different issues than somebody going to the Mahila with, uh, Kanya Vidyalaya in Jaunpur. 
So there are two different issues, and they will each have to be dealt at a local level. At, uh, policies will have to be targeted at this group as well as that group. So there cannot be one single policy and answer, but yes, the country needs to ri uh, rise up and see the importance of the productive asset that we've been missing, and we've got to go all out and get them to the mainstream. Yeah, thank you. Should we stop? Yeah. Sorry, we have be Okay, one last, last question. question. Yeah, last question. That's it. That's it. My name is uh, Sridhar Subramaniam. In terms of the social indices, uh, uh, Uttar Pradesh ranks amongst the lowest in India. Yeah. And... Um, uh, I, we appreciate, you know, uh, we are excited that a uh, young person like Akhilesh Yadav, who is highly educated, uh, though he comes from a political lineage, uh, has, uh, has come to the helm, uh, has taken over the, um, I mean, he's at the helm of affairs. Yeah. Now, uh, your ambition is laudable. Thank the you. vision is perfect. Thank you. But uh, do you think, uh, you know, and it, it would be a happy augury, if uh, Uttar Pradesh uh, becomes one of the most developed states of India. Because as they say, uh, the strength of the chain is determined by the weakest link. Yep. If you have a bubbling and a resurgent Uttar Pradesh, India can also grow. That's the, uh, 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 that's the derived logic. Yep. Now, going by the track record, do you think, uh, you know, uh, though you started off in right earnest, um, I, I have an uneasy feeling that uh, all this good work uh, can be compromised on the altar of uh, electoral compulsions of electoral politics. What's your take on that? Well, two things. Firstly, you said you've well begun. So thank you because they say well begun is half done. And secondly, you say uh, the problems with track record. I think history is not a determinant of your future. You, you can run, you know, uh, what you do tomorrow. There, there could be path dependencies. There could be legacies. But still, it's not a determinant. So yes, we are determined to change. And the third point you said about India and the UP relationship. Absolutely, in, uh, UP is one-sixth of India. There's absolutely no way India is going to go anywhere, anywhere at all, except for UP going somewhere. And why I'm so hopeful about UP going places not just somewhere, going places, and being one of the most fastest growing economies in the country is because that is where the talent is. That is where the opportunity is. We are the size of an economy almost as the uh, United States was about 60 years ago. So we have a huge in local economy within the state, 210 million people roughly, and the demographic dividend, which used to favor the south of the country about 30 years ago, dramatically favors North India, and especially UP and Bihar and Madhya Pradesh today. So that's where maximum opportunities will get made. That's where the Googles of tomorrow are going to be born. So I'm very, very positive in India, on Uttar Pradesh. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like uh, a few closing remarks. I, I'd like to acknowledge four people here. Uh, my friend uh, Amita Mattu, uh, Excellency High Commissioner for India and Australia, and Mrs. Mishra, and the young son who's getting his political lessons early. <laughs> uh, I have a suggestion for you, Minister. And uh, there's a huge trade that is made currently in old Queen Victoria statues. They fetch a lot of money. I thought, I thought that, I thought that uh, you may have a large number uh, of statues and of, uh, of elephants as well. Yes. Uh, which could earn you enough money to subsidize some of these programs you have in mind. Uh, uh, as you know, this is an overmanaged uh, event. We have not just a chairman, but also a host. Before the session, I asked uh, yeah, Professor Bargoa to, to explain to me what the difference was, and he said, oh, as the host, I will introduce you as chairman. I was waiting him, for him to say that as a host, he would be buying us all drinks <laughs> after the event. But <laughs> that's right. But uh, could I hand over to you yeah. to uh, give a vote of thanks? Thanks is a joint teamwork, as I said to you. But before we close, I wish to say thank you to audience. Without you, this conference was impossible. So thank you to all of you. 
That's the one thing. Secondly, you know, we heard so many times that to make a difference, you need a collective approach. But I contradict today. I can say that to you, why don't we think that one man cannot make a difference? Here I can tell you that one man can make a difference. This times, this conference, I can tell you, will be remembered in the history. And the man who make it possible is sitting in front rows over here. You all know that. Professor Mitu is there. This thing never happened in Melbourne in the last 30 years. It's a connectivity between the two countries. So I'm, I'm really delighted uh, to be here on this stage today uh, in his conference, uh, and which is making a difference already. We are delighted that we all Indians are still in audience are here, and we are delighted to see this young, young Turk Indian leaders who generated the question. First time I see in the audience that the young Indians also ask the questions. I think the like attracts likes. So with these remarks, I close these sessions and the conference. Tomorrow, nine o'clock. And Minister see you tomorrow, 9 o'clock. And the Minister of Peace Evans will be here. Thank you very much indeed.